Coming up next on We Are Marshall Today, two student researchers take home the gold in a statewide science contest. We'll have the results. And we'll catch up with former head football coach Sonny Randall. These stories and more up next on We Are Marshall Today. Hello and welcome to We Are Marshall Today. I'm Leah Clark Payne. And I'm Dan Hollis. West Virginia Star Symposium recently attracted dozens of researchers to Marshall University's Huntington campus. And while the name Star might suggest a conference on astronomy, there is so much more. The Science, Technology, and Research Symposium, commonly known as STAR, is a program associated with the Higher Education Policy Commission's Division of Science and Research. It's an effort to encourage competitive higher education research and facilitate the growth. Director Dr. Paul Hill says this year's symposium focused on science, technology, and research and its connections to sustainability. We're talking about cyber infrastructure, which is a, a big word that a lot of people wonder you know, what that is, but we're talking about how we use high-speed computers and advanced computing technology that allows research to really go in places where we haven't gone before. Professional researchers aren't the only ones who are benefiting from the research conference. Marshall's Dean of the the College of Science, Chuck Somerville, says undergraduate and graduate students are also involved. Students are, are here uh, showing some of the research that they're, they're doing. Both students at Marshall, uh, students from WVU are here, and we get a chance to see what, what they're doing. I mean, they're the future of, of science, and um, it's great to see what they're, what they're doing. Somerville and Hill agree the future of research hinges on student interest. Research has shown that if you engage students directly in research, they understand science much better. And so they get much more out of their science courses rather than just reading it out of a book. They actually engage in the science. So uh, it's an exciting project from all the way from the education spectrum through discovery of new uh, scientific uh, ideas that uh, come about through research. Marshall University students William Kelly and Melinda Varney won this year's Star Symposium student competitions, which included a cash award and an Apple iPad. Joining us now to talk about another exciting program here at Marshall University is Dr. Terry Finger, the director of our Forensic Science Center. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me today. You're welcome. Um, Marshall's Forensic Science Center has continued to expand its offerings mm -hmm. over the last few years. Update our audience a little bit on, on what's going on over there. Well, we have two major components of the Forensic Science Center. One is the working laboratories, the investigative side, but we have the master's degree in forensic science. So both components have advanced significantly over the years, and now we have one of the leading academic programs as well as a laboratory that serves the national needs in many different areas. Uh, we have several areas of focus in both the academic and the laboratory side. On the academic side, we have the digital forensics, the DNA laboratories, the crime scene investigative side, as well as forensic chemistry. And all four of those components are available to the students enrolled in the academic program. On the investigative side, we have the working DNA laboratory where we do casework as well as we are in charge of the uh, state CODIS database, which is the convicted felon database, and we do that in association with the West Virginia State Police Crime Lab. We also have a laboratory that focuses on digital forensics investigation, and this is a, an area that's expanding rapidly. There's a real need for this in West Virginia, so Marshall University and the Forensic Science Center are a real resource for the future generation of these types of investigators as well as serving the public as at the current time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get to the, the academic programs and, um, and the crime um, component of, mm -hmm. of the lab in uh -huh. just a second, but I do know that you have some good news recently. You just were awarded a five million dollar federal grant um, tell me a little bit about how that came about and what the money will be used for. Well, this is really a legacy for Senator Byrd, but uh, we've also had tremendous support from uh, Senator Rockefeller, Senator Goodwin, and uh, Congressman Rahal. So they made a joint announcement uh, several weeks ago uh, 
total amount of money, $5.9 million. And the major component is the DNA laboratory, whereas we also have funding for the digital forensics laboratory. And Dr. Graham Rankin received funding for his work in forensic chemistry, dealing with the explosive residue and fire and arson residue. So that's an exciting aspect of what we do. And that's a very uh, up and coming research project that Dr. Rankin is uh, in charge of. You referred a few minutes ago to your um, your master's program, mm -hmm. and it, it is one of the premier programs in the country. Um, mm -hmm. What do you what do you attribute that to? Why do you think it's so highly thought of? What are you doing? Uh, well, we have excellent quality instructors. We have full time as well as part time instructors, adjunct faculty. But I would say the fact that we have working laboratories in conjunction with the academic program. Students cannot actually handle evidence. They cannot become involved in the actual investigative side. But we have the equipment and everything, state-of-the-art equipment that uh, is available to students to learn. And by the time they graduate, they are some of the most well-trained, well-educated forensic scientists in the country. And the word's gotten around to the student population. And so we have applications from all over the country. And this year we took 20 students into our incoming class. And again, there's always a component of West Virginians, but we also have people from California, Texas, Minnesota, uh, all over the country. Um, quickly tell me about the undergraduate program that you have. Okay, there's a n new undergraduate program developing here on main campus through uh, integrated science and technology. And this is an exciting uh, venture because what it is, it's going to focus on digital forensics as one of the major components of this uh, program. Mm -hmm. And this is to me, I call it the next DNA. DNA has received all the attention over the years, and digital forensics will be uh, receiving that same amount of attention with cyber crimes, terrorism, and so forth. So there's so many applications for this area, and when the undergraduate program is fully developed, this will really be a feather in the martial cap. It's wonderful that we have such a strong academic program. Mm -hmm. I'll switch now to, to the other side, and you provide a lot of training mm -hmm. to law enforcement and health care providers. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, you are really uh, a valuable resource to um, police departments across the country. Mm -hmm. We've And over the last four years, we've had working relationships with Los Angeles uh, Crime Lab. We've worked on uh, their backlog of sexual assault kits. We've had a, pr a project with Miami-Dade, Charleston, South Carolina, and Huntington PD working on DNA evidence associated with property crimes. So all of these areas allow us to work with other agencies, not only within the state, but outside the state. So uh, when we go to national meetings, it uh, amazes me, and I've been in the game for quite a while, how well thought of Marshall is in the uh, national scope of things in forensic science. So you're really getting the name out there and people are contacting you now yes. for, for help? We have a close relationship with the National Institute of Justice. They're our grant funding agency and so uh, they're always looking for projects that Marshall can become involved in and so forth. Um, so what's on the um, what's on the horizon for the Forensic Science Center? I mean, you talked a little bit about developing uh -huh. the undergraduate program, but what else is going on? Well, we're really interested in rapid DNA analysis, and rapid DNA analysis is the type that within half hour, an hour, you have somebody's DNA profile from start to finish. Really? And it's called chip technology. So this is something that Marshall will become heavily involved in, both at the research and implementation side. And uh, so this is something that I think will move us to the next level uh, relative to what we do at the center. But we continue to have projects uh, with other cities. We're now in the uh, discussion with Denver. Uh, there's a project out there using certain types of computer software to analyze DNA data. And a couple weeks, I'm going down to New Orleans to have some discussions down there about working with them. So um, I know uh, as we're taping today, you're getting ready to head to a conference in D.C. And uh -huh. you just mentioned heading out to Denver. I imagine that for the director of a forensic science center, you have to stay mm -hmm. 
constantly updated on what's going on. We do, and uh, luckily we're, we work as a team, and we have some excellent people working in our facility. And at one time I would say, yeah, I'm you know, solely in charge, but we have so many uh, great people that, again, it takes a team to make things happen, and we've developed that team here at Marshall. Most of the individuals that we have working in our facility as full-time DNA analysts and chemists and so forth are what native West Virginians. And so to me, this is a perfect example of West Virginians not having to leave the state. They're here doing high technology-based uh, careers. And so I think uh, it's something worth pointing out. All right, great job. Appreciate you being on the show today. Well, thank you very much. All right, Dr. Terry Finger. And as we go to the break today, let's check in on athletics with Sports Information Director Randy Burnside. Congratulations are in order for Marshall University men's head soccer coach Bob Gray, who reached a milestone with his 400th career victory when the Thundering Herd knocked off Shawnee State earlier this year. Bobby is only the 14th coach in NCAA Division I history to reach that mark. And of course, he's quick to credit his players for much of that success. But to Bob's credit, 15 of his former players have gone on to be college head soccer coaches, and two of them have won small college national championships. The Thundering Herd football team will be back in action on October 13th for a rare Wednesday night nationally televised game on ESPN. Kickoff is set for 8 p.m. and the Herd will be playing a whiteout game with the Marshall team wearing white jerseys and all fans are encouraged to wear white to the game to support the effort. It will also be Military Appreciation Day and Faculty and Staff Appreciation Day at the ball game. Marshall's homecoming of course is October 30th when UTEP visits Jones C. Edwards Stadium. For more information on Marshall Athletics, go online to HerdZone.com. For the Marshall Sports Minute, I'm Randy Burnside. As you think about your future, who's your competition? Who are your chief competitors? I notice some of you looking to your right and left at your neighbors. You need to think bigger, much bigger. Choose Marshall University. Big enough to matter, small enough to care. Immerse yourself in your learning. Connect with your professors and have fun learning. That's important too. Find your passion, pursue your dreams. Marshall University. My name is Emily. I'm in seven years. I'll be an alcoholic. Hi. I'll start drinking in eighth grade, but my parents won't really notice because I'll do okay in school and everything will seem okay but everything won't be okay. Kids who drink before age 15 are five times more likely to have alcohol problems when they're adults. So start talking before they start drinking. Marshall University hosted a one-day seminar recently aimed at helping students start their own careers. The Extreme Entrepreneurship Tour is the brainchild of two young entrepreneurs who hit the big time before the age of 30. Michael Simmons and Sheena Lindahl co-founded the tour after developing multi-million dollar companies in their teens. You know, entrepreneurship completely changed my life and you know through the tour I've met hundreds of other young entrepreneurs who've been extremely successful either because of the impact they make or because they're creating a lot of wealth and basically in today's event we're going to highlight some of those really great stories and give steps that people and students can take to get started and be an entrepreneur or think entrepreneurially. Marshall students and local high school students attended the event which featured Simmons and another young entrepreneur Brian Ruby. Marshall University's Human Research Protection Program has received a national nod of approval. The Association for the Accreditation for Human Research Programs awarded Marshall a five-year reaccreditation. According to Bruce Day, director of the university's Office of Research Integrity, the designation means Marshall's program continues to meet or exceed all federal regulations regarding human subject research. A Marshall University psychology professor is studying how television audiences are affected when they watch stories about sexual violence on crime dramas. Dr. Paige mueller Liley presented her findings as part of a speaker series sponsored by the Women's Studies Program. What I'm kind of seeing is that when um, those shows portray um, male sexual assault victims, men tend to discount that and say, well, that can't happen to me, that doesn't happen, and it does happen to men. But women actually respond with even more fear than they had to begin with. That's what 
the trend is that I'm seeing. Mueller Liley says she will continue her investigative work and hopes to have the study published. The next speaker in the series is English professor Dr. Whitney Douglas, who's scheduled to speak in November on women who advocate on behalf of sexual assault victims. Colleges Against Cancer will host its first breast cancer walk on Saturday, October 23rd on Marshall's Huntington campus. You may register for the event by contacting Christina Isaacs, whose email address is on your screen. Various fundraising booths will be located along the walking path for walkers to visit. Registration is $20 and all proceeds benefit the American Cancer Society. Marshall University welcomed its largest freshman class this fall, but it also said hello to 70 new faculty members. The group was recognized at this year's first faculty meeting. For many of these folks, this is their first college faculty meeting. Some 70-plus new teachers were invited to the university's fall meeting where they were introduced to top administrators and each other. Marshall's faculty constitution calls for two annual meetings where business, opinion, and information are the order of the day. This is where uh, we, we deal with uh, issues that need more than just the faculty senate and the president to sign off on. And so it needs to be taken to the whole faculty. And this is where we do that. Then in the fall uh, meeting particularly, then we recognize the new faculty and new administrators. And so it's their official introduction to the university. Faculty Senate President Dr. Cam Brammer says new faculty members have much to learn when they accept the teaching appointment, including juggling a different type of work schedule. If you're a new faculty member, it's uh, time management finding because there's a lot demanded from new faculty. They have to teach, they have to do research, they have to do community and university service, and so they've got to find a way to balance all that time. Brammer says while faculty who've been around for a while certainly know the routine, they often have a different lesson to learn. For older faculty, I think that it's probably being able to say no <laughs> because, they, um, because they are um, seasoned. They have a tendency to get involved in a lot of activities and so sometimes they need to say no I, I can't do any more than what I'm already doing. Marshall University has more than 1,000 faculty members teaching at its Huntington and South Charleston campuses and centers around the state. And joining us now is the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts, Dr. David Pittenger. Welcome to the show, Dr. Thank Pittenger. you. Glad to be here. Let's just start with, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm an experimental psychologist by training, um, but uh, got the administrative bug. Uh, and I've been a department chair and an associate provost most recently at the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. But then the opportunity to be the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts uh, at Marshall became available, so I decided to trade up, and here I am. Tell us a little bit about the College of Liberal Arts. Well, the College of Liberal Arts is a very uh, broad and diverse program. We offer everything from classics and humanities to uh, criminal justice, sociology, psychology, English history. It's a, a very uh, large grab bag of, of courses, but the thing I'm most proud of is that we provide a high quality liberal arts education that might be provided at a private uh, liberal arts college, uh, but in a large comprehensive state university. You have 13 departments? Yes. What's that like being an administrator <laughs> of 13 different departments? It's always exciting uh, because uh, there are very, very different needs and uh, orientations for the program. So on the one hand, we have a very active uh, program in modern languages, uh, and we have, teach uh, four languages there, and so we're always working to make sure that we have well-qualified uh, staff to uh, teach our courses for us, maintain the language labs. And then at the same time, we have a psychology program with a uh, doctoral uh, degree and all of the challenges that uh, that provides. And so we're constantly working to make sure that uh, we provide best services for our students and uh, provide a high quality education. We just saw a story about the, uh, the new faculty. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Cola probably has lots of new faculty. Yes, uh, where we hired nine new faculty for tenure track uh, positions. Um, we're one of the larger uh, colleges uh, in terms of the number of faculty, and so there's always a fair amount of 
turnover. Uh, we've even hired uh, really an impressive lot of, of individuals, for example, uh, three young people in uh, English, all of whom come to us with uh, diverse uh, backgrounds and experiences. Two who are teaching uh, literature have been high school t uh, teachers, uh, and uh, so bringing into the classroom when they're teaching uh, courses for uh, teacher education, a wealth of, of experience of, from their own uh, efforts as teaching. But they're also well trained as scholars in contemporary literature. And uh, also uh, we have uh, folks in, uh, in history uh, who study and uh, write pr prolifically about uh, both Asian, Asian history as well as early colonial, uh, colonial American history, uh, new folks in sociology. And so it's really an exciting time for the uh, college because we're uh, bringing in new talent uh, that vitalizes our academic program and complements the, uh, the faculty we have now. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about the faculty sure. you have now. Um, it's important to have a good mix of, of faculty that have been here a while and right. new faculty. Okay. Very much so. Um, one of the things that uh, makes a university an um, exciting place to be is that constant uh, exchange, bringing in new ideas as well as preserving the traditions. Um, I'm proud to say that uh, our college, uh, whenever there is a teaching award uh, available, um, there's a high likelihood that we will either sweep the awards or that we'll um, uh, uh, do very well in terms of our representation. Some of our uh, senior faculty, Montserrat Miller, for example, in history, uh, State uh, Teacher of the Year, uh, year before, uh, has won every teaching award available on campus. And so, uh, you know, she's a highly regarded uh, teacher that uh, ends up being a mentor and, a, and a, an example uh, for the, uh, the new faculty that come in. Let's talk about, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, the value of, of a liberal arts education mm -hmm. in today's world. Talk a little bit about why that's important. Probably now more than ever, um, uh, liberal arts education is essential. Um, one of the things that we're, we're experiencing now is that um, things that were beyond imagination 10 or 15 years ago are now commonplace. Uh, and, and we're constantly seeing this revolution of new ideas producing uh, new technologies and new, new opportunities. And I think this is where liberal arts education becomes most uh, valuable because ours is the world of thought. Uh, what we're dealing with is training uh, individuals to think creatively uh, in the environment in which, they, in which they live. What we're finding is that corporations are looking for individuals who can write well, who can communicate effectively, uh, work collaboratively with, uh, with others uh, in, in, in terms of a um, knowledge-based uh, uh, economy. And what we're finding is that, for example, uh, corporations can train uh, individuals to do the, uh, the basic work of management, sales, whatever it may, may be, so long as the students have uh, that strong background in, in thinking and, and critical thought and, communi and communication. So I like to say it takes us four years to help someone to become proficient in a modern, uh, modern language. Uh, that would be way too expensive uh, for a corporation to, uh, to pursue. Uh, so we can provide a corporation corporations, uh, employers with, uh, with talented individuals who can think creatively, uh, think effectively, and then they can provide the, uh, the sort of burnishing that's needed for uh, them to be effective employees. And, and building on that, the, uh, the universities uh, move to a more critical thinking focus in the mm -hmm. first year seminar. Right. College of Liberal Arts has to play uh, an important role right. in that. I think critical thinking has always been the hallmark of uh, a liberal arts education. Um, if look, look at history, uh, for example. The study of history is not memorizing concatenation of dates and facts of when certain events occurred. It's essentially a, a, an attempt to understand the evolution of ideas and uh, political movements and historical trends that define our current situation. And to do that, you, one has to look beyond just dates and, and facts to really begin to understand the phenomenon that occurred in the past that now create a, a certain context for the, uh, for the present. The study of philosophy uh, is, in fact, the, uh, the, the critical analysis of ideas and how we uh, present things. And even something as uh, seemingly simple as reading a poem and trying to understand what the author is, is doing 
and requires a considerable amount of critical analysis, not only uh, looking at the surface structure, the words and how the author uses the words, but the images that, uh, that are created. And so critical thinking has been uh, the central component of a liberal arts education uh, since it orig originally occurred several, uh, several centuries ago. And so we're very pleased to continue to contribute that uh, tradition. Dr. Pinter, thanks for being here. Much appreciated. Okay, great. And before we go to break today, let's meet the Peters family, all graduates of Marsh University. Eric Peters graduated from Marshall in 1973 and 1976 with degrees in journalism. His wife, Cindy, graduated in 1977 with her BSN. They are the parents of four Marshall graduates. Catherine and Heather are members of the class of 2003. Anne graduated in 2006 and Matthew in 2010. Grandson Brady, they say, is in training. The Peters family of Tyler County, West Virginia, members of the Marshall University alumni family. From the classroom straight to your computer. I teach international marketing online 100%. I conduct this class from my office, from my home, and it is 24-7 available to students across the country. I would say this has been one of the most challenging and rewarding experiences not only for me, for my students as well. Nationally accredited, affordable, convenient. MU Online. Prescription drug abuse and misuse is a serious problem. Taken inappropriately, prescribed medication is just as dangerous and deadly as street drugs. So it's important for you to know it is illegal for you to share your medication or take medication prescribed to someone else. He once called the plays on the football field for Marshall University. And now he comments on the plays from the broadcast booth. We caught up with former coach Sonny Randall before a recent game. You know, I just think uh, when we left here, uh, we left uh, Stan Parrish with 21 starters. And uh, I'll never forget that, and I'll never forget the kids that were here. Uh, I know Coach Hamrick, uh, he uh, reminds me quite often. He said, you gave me grief for four years. He said, but I was one of your good ones. If we had 40 Mike Hamricks, you know what, John? I'd still be coaching. Have you been over to old Fairfield Stadium? That's where we coached. And it was a little more difficult. Once this was built, then everything fell into place. And i tell you what, uh, I kind of refer to uh, Mike Hamrick. Is this place going from, uh, you know, an outhouse to an ice cream parlor? And it's uh, like coming home. You know, it truly is. And with Keith and I, I think we're like 40 and 5. And, uh, well, I'm not sure it gets a whole lot better than that. You know, it's like we're, uh, you know, a part of each other. Uh, we're connected. And uh, he knows what I'm going to say, and I know pretty much what he's going to say. And uh, it's like a mutual admiration society. Do you, do you think he ever really knows what you're going to say? Has no idea. And neither do I. <laughs> yeah, it is super to be a part of the family again, and I hope that uh, I can come back many more times. Sonny Randall coached at Marshall from 1979 to 1983. That's it for We Are Marshall Today. I'm Dan Hollis. And I'm Leah Clark Payne. Be sure and join us next time for an update on the College of Fine Arts. Take care. It's easy to tell if you've had way too many. But what if you've had just one too many? There we go. Buzz driving is drunk driving. As you think about your future, who's your competition? Who are your chief competitors? I notice some of you looking to your right and left at your neighbors. You need to think bigger, much bigger. Choose Marshall University. Big enough to matter, small enough to care. Immerse yourself in your learning. Connect with your professors and have fun learning. That's important too. Find your passion, pursue your dreams. Marshall University.